This is the Thoughtful Travel Podcast. I'm your host, Amanda Kendall of the notaballerina.com travel blog. Every episode, I'll share travel tales from several fellow travel lovers, and together we hope to entertain and inspire you, remind you of some of your own great travel experiences, and encourage you to hit the road again soon. Welcome to episode 148 of the Thoughtful Travel Podcast. Today's episode is all about solo traveling, both the fun and the fears. I think that if you haven't traveled solo before, you're quite likely to have a few anxieties or worries about it. I know I certainly did before I ever um, took off solo, solo. And today's guests all have similar stories like that to tell. I think it's a pretty common way to feel. Uh, but once you've done it, then a lot of people will say it is a fabulously fun way to travel. Uh, I think, and I think probably actually my guests would um, by and large agree as well today, uh, but I think a good combination of sometimes solo travel and sometimes not is a really good way to do it because there's pros and cons of both. Now, uh, I have not had the chance to do enough solo travel in my life to date. And of course, at the moment, I often travel with my son, which is fabulous. I'm not going to you know, leave him at home just so I can travel solo. But later this year, I do have just a few days of solo travel. And even that is, you know, kind of something I really look forward to. I love being 100% in control of what I, well, not control, control's not the thing, but 100% in charge of what I do and when and nobody else to account for. And I just love that. So yes, I'm uh, actually going to Queensland for a conference, but the way that flights and media trips and stuff have worked out means I think I have three days to choose what I do. Hopefully I won't be trying to catch up on work and stuff. I'm going to try and have an actual bit of traveling trip kind of thing happening. So fingers crossed. Anyway, enough of my um, not enough solo traveling experiences. I've got three people on the show today who have had lots of experience traveling solo and some really interesting stories to tell. So first up, we have Alastair Humphreys, who's done lots of really interesting trips, and you'll hear more about some of those in future episodes. Uh, But to start off with, Alastair and I started talking about his experiences of solo travel. I've roughly tried to alternate through my traveling life, um, going by myself, going solo, and going with someone else. And the reason I always alternate is that there's such pros and cons of both Mm. i think going with someone else is fun it's more fun you have happy memories to laugh about later in the pub um and in many ways it's easier and more comforting the downside is you can't be so blissfully selfish and you have to compromise and the other person usually becomes really gets on your nerves (laughs) usually um and the upside of solo travel is that freedom the total and utter freedom and what I enjoy is, for me, is the responsibility to set myself challenges and standards that I want to try and attain. And then no one cares except me to try and work hard and match those. And then if I manage to make it through to the end, I can feel proud that I did that by myself. So I, I find solo travel hard and often quite soul sh- soul searching, mm. but I also find it very rewarding um one one trip i did solo was um i walked across india across southern india from coast to coast um following the holy kareri river mm. and that was an experience of just me on my own walking down little tracks by the river bank wondering who i would meet that way we meet that day and inter- india is an interesting place to think about solo travel because on the one hand, you are never alone. There are a billion people there and there seems to be someone behind every tree <laughs> who's desperate to talk to you and ask you questions and take you home to their, take you to their house for chai and some food. Uh, so, and all of that part of India can get quite overwhelming at mm. times. Um, and so you can actually feel quite alone by yourself. You don't have anyone to, to, um, of help deflect the endless attention that you get in certain parts of the world but on the other hand it forces you just into total immersion rather than just chatting to your friend about tv back at home you are just forced to engage with all the people you meet and just roll with it and see what happens and visit people's homes and uh, often get invited in to stay with them and so i found i found that solo experience of walking through india completely exhausting Hmm. completely 
overwhelming, but also provides a lifetime of sensory stimuli and, and memories as well. So I'm definitely glad that's a trip that I'm definitely glad I did solo. Yeah, that that kind of trip would really have been very different if you were travelling with a friend, wouldn't it? It would. And because I found it hard, I suspect I would have hidden quite a lot. I would have hidden by just talking to my friend mm -hmm. and often probably ignoring people because it, it gets a bit overwhelming in India at times um, and using my friend to deflect some of the attention at times. So yeah. I think it required going by yourself on the trip like that requires a bit more guts and a lot more energy. But I think, um, I think overall, I always say to people, if you have the guts, if you can be bold enough to do it, go travel by yourself. Mm -hmm. If for whatever reason that feels a bit too hard for you right now, then Go with a friend. It's better than doing nothing at all. And in many ways, it's a great thing to do. But I, I can completely understand why it's often daunting for people to, to travel solo. What Alastair says about finding solo travel quite soul-searching, I think, is one of the magical parts of it. Uh, I live a pretty busy life, I suppose. And it's amazing when I get those times on my own, if I'm traveling on my own, and getting that time to really get into your own head. I think, and especially when you're somewhere away from home, I think that makes it so much easier. You break all your normal routines and you're being inspired by all these other things around you. And I find that kind of soul searching part of it really, really rewarding and interesting. Not necessarily fun, but great. All right. Now, my next guest today is Justin Watson, and he also had like the same kind of feelings as me that at first traveling solo seemed like quite you know, a bit possibly scary and, and too difficult. Uh, but of course, he managed to find a way to do it and is glad he did. I guess for me, I didn't obviously start traveling solo either because I was, I was one of those people who loved reading atlases and looked at maps and dreamed of going to places. <laughs> and yet taking that step to go traveling was seemed to be incredibly difficult. So difficult, in fact, I ended up doing the, uh, you, well, I won't say the usual thing, but going on a Kentucky tour. <laughs> the and, common thing, for sure. <laughs> the common thing. And I would never go on a Kentucky tour ever again after that for <laughs> many good reasons. But, uh, at the same time, I told people that if you're not sure, just go on a Kentucky tour and see how you like that because <laughs> you're probably guaranteed to have fun. You might then get a bit of travelling in and then realise, hey, I can go traveling yeah sometimes um, it's just enough and, and to I do that and see the world a little bit even if it's from a you know less than perfect method but then you realize you know the world is just like home really so there's uh, it's not as scary as we think it might be and, yeah and i was then lucky that i did know a couple of people who at that stage in their life were traveling a fair bit and so i managed to go on a, a trip to vietnam with a friend for a couple of weeks and you know that wasn't too scary and it was actually quite amazing and a great place to go to and then after that it was just like the training wheels are off <laughs> and, and off I went and I think I think my first truly solo trip was to Central America so not wow. even a not even a, a really sort of run-of-the-mill um you not know, an easy first study, solo no study, Europe or Canada or New yeah. Zealand Japan, wow. even Japan, I would consider as a, and I've never been to Japan, but these places where lots of travelers go to and they're fairly well catered for travelers. Central America was like, I didn't even speak Spanish when I decided to go on this trip. So, <laughs> <Wow. laughs> so one, of, and, and, and I, one of the things I did do though, which I think is probably useful for people who worry about language skills and things like that was I actually put in the first week of my trip, I was in, uh, Guatemala and um, uh, the town of Antigua is re renowned for its uh, Spanish language school. So, uh -huh. it, and I thought, and it was a, and it's a beautiful, I think it's a UNESCO um, site. Uh, it's nestled in a valley between three volcanoes. Mm. Uh, and it's just a really beautiful town, not too hard to get around, uh, you know, all by walking. So I registered in a Spanish school and did Spanish from, I think it was eight till midday or nine till midday every, every day for the week. Uh, and then in the afternoons I did, you know, the Spanish school actually had trips on oh. in the afternoon. So one of them was to go climb up a volcano and another one, which didn't end up happening was they had a staff for students, uh, football game that they <laughs> usually 
usually did pending numbers and things like that. Um, but I did a little bit of Spanish before I left. Then I did that kind of week of Spanish. And then after that, I felt really comfortable just with basic stuff and talking to people and just asking for directions or what was on the menu and things like that. So it, for me, was a useful step to get over that or what happens when I'm traveling solo. Mm. And, and yeah, you know, language is one of those things that everyone always asks me, how do you, how do you, how do you order something in the you know, cafe <laughs> if you don't speak the language? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, some, some places are going to be a lot harder than others to do that. But I think, you know, there's a lot of French and Spanish speaking countries in the world and they're probably, if you want to go somewhere like that, you're probably going to be able to learn a bit more of the language. Some of the uh, Asian languages, I think, might be more difficult to learn from my experience. So. Yes, yes, I agree. The, yeah, the further removed they are from English, the harder. But even then, you know, as you, you know, you learn the more you travel, you can always get by. Um, but I think right. you're right when people are worried about solo travel, they they think, oh, you know, it'll be a disaster and they'll end up, you know, starving and homeless or something. Yeah, well, one of the, one of the best meals I ever had was in uh, Guangzhou in China. And I wasn't there for very long. I was only there really a uh, couple of nights because I was on my way to Central Asia. But I uh, just around the corner from the hostel I was staying in, um, I found a restaurant and they had some pictures and I figured, well, that's going to be good enough. And they, I walked in and they looked at me and they've gone, what's this? As if, what are you doing in our restaurant? <laughs> <laughs> but they came up and and I I said, oh, a menu. I pointed a menu and she bought, and I, I hoped they had one in English or something like that because, you know, a hostel nearby, uh, usually they, they have menus and things like that and they mm. have menus. <laughs> and so she just made – she made a, uh, you know, flapping wings like a chicken thing. And I <laughs> just said, nodded my head and said, yes. <laughs> and out came this, oh, oh, it was a hot pot of, uh, it was a chicken and it had garlic and vegetables. And it wasn't like any Chinese, Chinese dish you'd get in a Chinese restaurant. But then I go, I don't think any Chinese food in China is like what you get in a Chinese <laughs> restaurant. But it was just one of the best dishes I've ever had. And I can re- remember that. And, you know, that wouldn't have happened if I wasn't going travelling solo and, you know, just <laughs> picked a place at random that looked open, lights on, looked – I mean, the place had, you know, plastic tablecloths and it, or everything was uh, – it was all very um, – Nothing fancy. Nothing fancy. Um, even the uh, – like the the bowl and the cup and everything was wrapped in plastic – and I had to open those up. So, and I think that was a sign. And all of this was just completely foreign to me, but it was an experience and it really wasn't that hard to navigate around. Mm, mm-hmm. Just, you just kind of, I mean, they, no one's going to, uh, you know, no one's going to say anything because you don't know what you're doing or what where you are. People are generally very, yeah, exactly. Annoying, and you learn that. I think solo travelling, more than any other kind of travelling, makes you learn pretty quickly that you will always get by no matter what. You know, a language barrier, whatever the problem is, there's always ways around it and often that, you know, results in all sorts of fun or like in Justin's case here in in Guangzhou, one of the best meals he's ever eaten. So I loved hearing those kind of stories. Now, my final guest today is Michaela Fantanelle from Italy and... Nowadays, she has done a lot of solo travel. I'm always in awe of of some of her really awesome solo trips. But uh, some of her first solo travel was, well, not fun all the time, and she was a bit worried some of the time. But I'll let her explain. One story that I like to talk about and talk to people is uh, when I started uh, traveling solo. Mm. I did start in my early 20s, and... uh, Actually, I did only very, very easy trips, you mm-hmm. know, going to cities or just visiting friends of my own in Germany, UK. And then I was really looking forward to do something different and and do it overseas. And I thought, oh, where shall I do that? Where shall I start from? And I said, well, the States and uh, in the Canada. In Canada, I have my, my I have family, I have my uncle and my auntie there. Uh-huh. So what I did, 
<laughs> yeah, I was in my end in twenties, yes, twenty eight, something like this. I organized three weeks uh, on my own, and I went to visit them. And obviously, I was telling them what I was doing next. And I told them, oh, I'm going to New York on my own. And yeah, oh, it wasn't so, you know, they were not so happy or they were just oh, saying, no. oh, you are a woman traveling alone. <sighs> it's, uh, is, it, is it safe to be there? I don't think so. They were just, you know, trying to um, talk me out of this or maybe mm-hmm. just, just trying to make sure that I was sure what I was doing and things like that. So on my way to New York, I was traveling on the bus and I was just all this discussion was going on into my mind and I, mm. I was thinking well, am I am I right what I'm doing uh, is it okay to go my you know you are somewhere you are overseas mm. in a different country and when I got there and I got into my hotel I had booked this big it was a big huge room and <laughs> I I thought now oh, I couldn't I couldn't get out of the room I was like paralyzed somehow mm. but not it wasn't just fear. It wasn't fear. It was just, I need something now. I need someone else telling me that it's not like this. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I just need to restore my confidence. Yes. And this is something that as a young woman, you, you probably need it because you are just experiencing. Uh, it was the end of 90s, 93. No, the, 93, not the end of 93. So quite uh, 25 years ago. So I, what I did, I... I called a long distance, um, a long distance uh, relative that I knew he was in New York, but he couldn't meet up with me. So I, uh-huh. I talked to him and I asked him, I said, look, this is what my uncle says. And I'm, <laughs> now I want to hear from you what's going on in New York. It is, do you think it's safe? Can I go by myself? And we just had a lovely conversation. It was just so reassuring me Aww. and say, look, I've been living in this city. It's a really safe city for you are in Manhattan. I mean, you are not some in a place in a very, you know, um, that with high way. crime or anything or, yeah, exactly. High crime or whatever. Or so he said, you have really to be, um, sure about and you have to be confident about this and we had a lovely conversation so I was just Mm. you know just full of energy again to go out and then I said okay I was asking where shall I go or if you go it was giving a a good tip that is something that I always do all the time when you are in a place just go nearby for dinner near today to your hotel where you're staying to your accommodation just Mm. walk Mm -hmm. the rest so this is what I did. I walked into the Hard Rock Cafe. Oh, really? <laughs> cool. <laughs> it was just 50 meters, not far from there. Oh, perfect. Just a short, very short walk. And I was so happy to be there with live music. But they didn't have a table for me. So I oh, sat no. at this beautiful bar, you know, the, the oh. round the, <laughs> the round uh, bar mm-hmm. so I was sitting there and they took my order and then okay I was having a beer the small one because um, I'm not really a drinker and <laughs> while I was wa- waiting for my table uh, and I was finished with my beer another beer came and I said what's that I didn't know that that and they said oh there's someone offering you oh okay <laughs> okay I said, thank you and then I-, I was drinking that one and then the waiters didn't come. They didn't ask. I said, well, where is my table? <laughs> and they kept me just waiting and waiting. So after that, I had something else. And I'm not used to drink. <laughs> 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 and then she finally came. And I was a little bit, you know, just with, I don't know, a couple of beer or something yes, else. A bit yeah. cheerful. <laughs> yeah, a bit cheerful. And then she said, oh, I'm afraid. I think we forgot all about your oh, table. No. I said, oh. Oh no! And then she said, "Do you, do you mind sitting with someone else?" I said, "Oh no, don't mind now. It's so late, you know." <laughs> and I'm so, so happy, <laughs> and I'm so happy to get the table. So <laughs> she got me together with a group of, I think they were from Japan, oh, and funny. nice young people from Japan, and and they were happy. They were asking me everything. Where are ah, you alone? You travel alone? Yes. So. We saw we had dinner together and then we I had another beer. So I'm like, I thought, oh my <laughs> God, because I know that I can't drink. But somehow this is the, the, that, that was the age. Now I'm not really, I don't care about it if I don't drink because, uh, 
But at that age, you want to be like uh, everyone mm, else. You want to you fit want in. To yeah. Thing. You want to fit in. You want to have your drink. So I had a, another beer, a little <laughs> one, but that was the, oh, I was completely drunk. And that, that would be enough for me guy, too. <laughs> <laughs> this guy, these guys were telling me, are you feeling okay? I feel, oh, I think I had too much of this beer. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, do you want us to take you? I know, I know exactly where it is. I just have to go out, left, turn left, 50 meters, I'm there. <laughs> and they it's said, lucky oh, you were no, so we close. <laughs> I was so close. And, and they were very, very cheerful people, very nice people, loving, caring people. Say, oh, no, we take you home and we make sure that you get home. Get back. <laughs> so they just took me to the entrance of the hotel, but I said, I'm okay, I'm okay. <laughs> but when I was in my in my bedroom, everything was, you know, I was you just seeing everything moving around, and probably I was drunk. And <laughs> probably. I was laughing the day, the following day, I was just laughing at myself because, you know, I was so worried about <laughs> <laughs> getting lost or doing something wrong, and I. You know, it's just serendipity, you know, it's just uh, yeah. how things develop. Mm. But nothing happened. It was just uh, a very nice sit- situation. Mm. And uh, I learned a lot about this because I learned, first of all, that you don't ha- really have to to listen to what people say to you because yes. they might think a different way. Yeah. But somehow, so you know, it was my family, my uncle, my auntie mm. that they were saying, oh, Oh, be careful, it's not safe for a woman. So you you somehow also feel that you have to take in consideration what mm. your family says, but you you still are stubborn and you say, I don't think it's like that. I want to hear someone else saying just the opposite. Mm-hmm. And I had another part of family, even long distance relative, but saying that uh, it was my, I think, third cousin in the, in the line, you know, so I right. was telling, <laughs> I'm from this city and I know, and I know what's going on, and I can tell you that you will. So I, I was just to uh, bring balance in, into this mood. My mood yes. was restored, and my confidence was restored. As Michaela mentions right at the end there, I think confidence is a really important part of of happy solo traveling. And your confidence can be shaken by various things, like in Michaela's case here, a relative suggesting that it wasn't safe for her to go traveling on her own to New York. And... It's hard to be sure, especially if you're taking this risk of going off on your own, but her strategy of just basically asking enough people until she got the answer she wanted, I think is is not a bad strategy, I must say. Uh, And obviously over time with practice, solo travel becomes easier and you're much more confident that you can totally make it all okay. So I hope that if you haven't yet done some solo traveling, this might help you set off on a first solo trip. And if not, I'm sure you can relate to some of the stories. Uh, If you've already done some solo trips, I'm sure you can relate to some of the stories quite well. Do come along and chat with us about your solo trips in our Facebook group. If you don't know it yet, it's called Thoughtful Travellers and it's lots of fun. I'd also like to say a huge thank you to my three great guests today. Um, We had Alastair Humphreys on for the first time. You can find him at alastairhumphreys.com. Alastair's an author with a big back catalogue of really, really cool books. I have just ordered one for my son because he's uh, one of Alastair's many adventures was cycling pretty much all the way around the world. And he's also written some children's books about cycling around the world. So I think uh, my son's going to enjoy that. Um, but Alistair actually has a new book out called My Midsummer Morning. And I'll leave a link to that in the show notes. We'll talk some more about that in a future episode because the story behind it is quite fascinating and quite unique. Uh, next, I chatted with Justin. And you can keep up with Justin's travels at Justin's World, which is at justins.world. And lastly, but definitely not least, Michaela from Rocky Travel, and you can find um, lots of solo travel tales. And um, Michaela, I love her because she loves Australia, (laughs) so she writes a lot about Australia, but from uh, um, the point of view of an Italian instead, so it's extra fascinating. And you can find her at rockytravel.net. All of these links, if you need to look them up again, will be in the show notes. And for this episode, the show notes are at notaballerina.com slash 148. Thank you very, very much for listening. This has been another episode of the Thoughtful Travel Podcast. Show notes and other information are at notaballerina.com slash podcast. 
Join me again soon for another chat about why we travel. Bye for now. Bye for now.